You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Now let's get right to our first panel of the day, graciously sponsored by Dev Experts. This panel is Options Trailblazers. You're going to hear from some of the options experts that are at the forefront of innovation in our industry. To help me introduce the moderator and get things moving this morning, please welcome to the stage Peter Snazdell, Senior Vice President of Sales and Business Development at Dev Experts. Thanks, Matt. Uh, good morning, everyone, and congratulations for actually making it to day three of the OIC. I can't quite believe I'm standing up here at the moment, but um, well done. Um, dev experts. So we design and build custom solutions for uh, today's and tomorrow's uh, market participants. Um, we have uh, a wide variety of products. Um, but the most relevant product for this audience is our flagship trading product, which is DX Trade XT. Uh, DX Trade XT is a um, fully customizable trading OMS platform, which is focused on futures, equities, and most importantly, options. Um, we also, along with our product suite, uh, we have our company DX Feed that provides uh, market access to data. Um, that data is real-time, calculated, and historical. And that data is sourced from a wide variety of financial institutions worldwide. Um, so we pride ourselves on being an innovative company. And pretty much everything we do involves innovation in one form or another. So we're very proud to be sponsoring this first panel discussion of the day, which is focused on innovations in the options space. So please join me in welcome, welcoming to the stage uh, our moderator, the US CEO of eToro, Lule Demise. Uh, US CEO of a company called eToro, which is an online social investing trading platform. We got into the options space about a year and plus ago and have integrated into our experience and are really excited about growing retail options um, in the US. We're very committed to active trading at large. The eToro franchise is in about 100 countries. It's a global, um, the way I describe it is sort of like Robin Hood, but on a global basis. Uh, it's in 100 countries, and the US is one of the markets that we're looking to sort of crack and make our footprint in. So I'm excited today to be having an illustrious panel where I get to interview them, which is very exciting. Um, so um, on, my right, on, my, on my left right here, we have Jeremy Bendo, who is a member experience lead for Memex. Uh, on the middle, we have Lex Ring. Don't she, don't she, don't she. <laughs> uh, Lutheran Housing. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Um, who is a partner of relations Content officer for Trade Year. My mic's not working. It's not working. Okay. Oh, good. I'm not the only. Oh, one. okay. Sorry. And um, over, uh, all the way to the to the other end of the of the stage is Laura Morrison, who is most recently Chief Revenue Officer for Direction. Uh, so we have an exciting conversation about um, innovation and what it means to be a trailblazer in the options industry. Um, so we'll get started first. And if if you each could do me a favor of telling everybody. What does your firm do? What, what is your mission in the option space? And how are you sort of bettering or improving the customer experience and innovation in options? So Memex was actually founded by many of you in the audience, unless they're all still recovering from last year. 
last night, sorry, I forgot about the mic. Um, we were founded to, re to represent the needs and voice of, of investors. And as our name states, we're here for you. Lex? Um, so I'm with Tradeier. Uh, we are a retail brokerage, online brokerage. Um, we provide an API solution to other technology platforms so that they can um, enable their platforms to become uh, trade tradable. So you can actually uh, place trades on those things. So we serve as the broker behind the scenes and we interact with many of the uh, technology platforms that are out there that are looking for that sort of uh, service. Can you give us, a, for instance, in some of the things that you're doing for your customers? Um, well, we are, we are uh, very keen on education. So we do a lot of that. I'm, a, I'm the chief content officer on our hub, which is an ecosystem of educational sort of um, uh, curated content. So we do live shows and that sort of thing. Um, we like the educated options trader a lot. Very solid kind of, kind of uh, community. So we try to really push that education piece. So. Can you tell us a little bit about how you are in it, you've been innovating in the options space, especially around ETFs as well? Sure. Thank you. It's great to be here, and I'm so happy there are some more people funneling in this morning. Congratulations, you made it, <laughs> and we appreciate that. So Laura Morrison, I most recently have worked with Direction as Chief Revenue Officer, but what I'm really known for is building the ETF listings businesses at iconic brands such as the New York Stock Exchange, Euronext, and SIBO. Um, once joining SIBO, the timing was perfect because there was a few folks, uh, Karan Sud from SIBOvest and Bruce Bond from Invesco, approaching me on a concept of buffered ETFs. And that was only back in 2017. Now, that asset class in the ETF space represents 46 billion in assets under management. So adding to the very active trading of options, adding to the very active trading of ETFs on exchange in the equity space. So that's truly how I first entered the option space. Fantastic. Can you each tell us, I mean, I think risk management um, among p options insiders is an understood sort of in the DNA of the product, but in popular culture, people don't necessarily associate risk management when they think options. Can you tell us how um, you all are in your respective firms and, and responsibilities addressing risk management in options, whether it's liquidity risk or other types of risk? If I may, I'd like to take a step back to 2010 when we all adopted SEC's market access rule. And what that did was really, market makers were always focused on risk management, of course, but what the market access rule was forced all market participants to think about risk management. So to your point about not everybody really understanding risk, I think at that point we all said, okay, this is really important to us. Fast forward to 2020, Jane Street wrote a white paper called, quote, the dead man switch, making options markets safer with active quote protection. In essence, what the paper proposed is that there's a more active, dynamic conversation between market participants and the exchanges in a real-time basis. What that allows participants to do is track their risk more efficiently, and theoretically what it means for firms like you and you, that we're, or the end customer that we're providing, or Jane Street or others are, are able to, to provide better markets, tighter, more liquid, because they feel more confident in their quoting abilities on the exchange. Indeed. Necessity is the mother of invention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Lex? Yes. Um, so first of all, I'm not on the broker-dealer, so I, I need to disclaim that. Um, but from, from their angle, they, you know, we have automated systems that, that will show the, the brokerage team where, where there's early exercise for dividend risk, um, where there is illiquid sort of options. Expiring options are always noted um, so that that retail customer can take care of that problem. Um, and in the retail space, if, if they don't take care of the problem, we take care of it for them, right? Um, so we have a lot of that automated. Um, additionally... I'd say that our in-house system, one of our systems is, is called Tradier Pro. So that's a sophisticated platform. And inside that platform for our, our audience um, are a lot of risk control measures um, that exist in there. So you can analyze any sort of strategy that you're going to put out there um, in the marketplace uh, you know, and, and, and look at the risk components, the probability of profit, all that sort of thing, which is a really great tool for them. Um, additionally, 
because of the way you know the retail side works with with margin, um, they can't really send out an order unless they're they're certified at a certain option level and uh, they have enough money to do so. So it's it, it doesn't even go out the front door before um, if they, if it's not allowed for them. Got it. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, from my perspective, while I don't have a lot to add other than what the exchanges did together to really protect against risks in the marketplace, um, the reason these buffer ETFs were born, were launched, is because it was the institutional or retail investor that wanted to depend on the experts here in the room in trading those options and providing that buffer that allowed for the downside protection in return for the upside returns uh, capped at a certain point in the way that these ETFs are constructed. So, I mean, honestly, that, that was the key aspect to it uh, because certainly options can be complex, options can be confusing, and having it in a package and paying a relatively small management fee for that was very attractive to many of the clients and advisors who provide uh, advice on using these products. Fantastic. Um, you know, one of the things that I think we've learned is that the, the experience of software has helped demystify some of that complexity, right? Whether it's the journey that we are designing for retail investors, um, explaining the why behind something. I feel like software and the innovations of fintechs has really helped um, advance, uh, dis sort of reduce that complexity. So tell me how each of you, this title of the, of the panel is Trailblazers. I think somewhere in it has Trailblazers. Um, <laughs> Each of your firms are looking to advance innovation and blazing forward when it comes to the option space. We'll start on the other side today. Okay, that's great. As I'd shared in the past, my entry into offering ETFs, while there are 18,000 ETFs throughout the world with 12 trillion in assets that track this industry, um, there, you know, as it relates to this small and up and coming segment of 46 billion, in the uh, buffered type ETS, you know, it, they were kicked off initially by and launched with approval through the SEC, which we, as the exchange, worked very hard on behalf of the issuers to move forward with these so that they could launch. Um, now there's, there are so many other participants involved, both large and small, including BlackRock and Invesco and JP Morgan, who realize that their customers need that protection in, in these products. So it's, um, I mean, in short, it's, it's, it's that simple and that straightforward. Lex? Um, so uh, our innovation is for the retail person. What I find with that segment of, of the market is that they're, they're always looking for a trade idea generator. So you sit in front of that computer and you're like, what do I do now? Um, so we, we've focused on that a good bit. And, and, and some of the systems that we use have, um, you know, back testing sort of, sort of data. Uh, there's there's um, great idea generation around volatility complexes um, in the system as well. So we try to help in that market. The other thing that, that is common is that um, our sophisticated retail audience, they have other jobs. They don't do this for a living. So they need some sort of automation. Um, you know, and, and we really focus on that a good bit too, so that they can get into a trade, get out of a trade, without having to have an emotional block um, on, on that, that trade. So we really focus on that as well, um, and especially with order complexes uh, on top of that. Mm -hmm. So like you said earlier, the name of our, our panel includes the word trailblazers, and I really wanted us to come out like Katniss from Hunger Games on a chariot that was on fire. <laughs> but Trisha from OIC said there might be a fire marshal issue, so we just kind of walked out <laughs> normally. Um, so picking up from where, we, where I left off earlier in terms of innovation and risk management, the, the proposal from Jane Street was actually implemented by Memex on our options exchange, and we were the first exchange to do so. And it, it, it speaks to the point of Memex launching because we wanted to foster competition. And as a result of us introducing this functionality, I believe there are other exchanges that are adopting it. So ultimately, the industry as a whole will benefit from us driving that feature forward. Just out of curiosity from the audience sort of temperament, how many of you feel that there is um, 
a, an immense amount of innovation that takes place in options, without being, objectively speaking. Okay, so we don't, I mean, I think I saw maybe two hands. I think that's a really interesting um, observation because I think that the consumer, I, I mean, I deal with the retail consumer and the retail consumer is devouring um, this product and excited about what it can do um, for them. But I think it's interesting that the inter industry insiders want to put, how many of you want to push it more to be innovative? Sure. Interesting. We like it just the way it is, not too whole. Not too <laughs> I had a lot of conversations this week, throughout the week where firms here and there are innovating. I don't know, th sometimes people think about the definition of innovation being this huge transformative thing, and it doesn't necessarily need to be that. Like the, uh, the Navy SEAL guy yesterday, he talked a little bit about you know, continue, small continuous improvements. If we can each raise our hands an inch higher, that ultimately will drive the industry forward. And I think that's what a lot of firms yeah. are doing. It doesn't have to be this big, grandiose thing. You know? I mean, a, an options trader is an incrementalist by nature, so I get it. Um, so now let's talk about um, retail. Uh, for the last 10 years, retail adoption has really um, taken up a lot of room in, in the options industry and has influenced a lot of innovation. Uh, can you tell us how the retail adoption of options has changed or impacted the way you do business at your respective firms? So given we only launched our options exchange in February, we kind of missed that exponential growth in, in retail. But what I can say is that because of that growth, Memex was actually able to launch an options exchange. The member, because we watched the, our founders watched that growth, they decided that the next step for Memex was to launch an options exchange. And since then, two months, two months since launch, we've already gained one, one and a half to two percent market share and are continuing to grow from there. So because of that growth, we're just continuing to ride that wave. It's unfortunate we missed that boat, but that's why we're here as a result. Do you have any um, insight as to what percentage of your flow is retail versus institutional? versus institutional, it's, it, we're still pretty, pretty small. It's, I'd say, 40% of our flow is probably retail versus market maker. More Got so. it. Mm -hmm. How about you, Lex? How has, I mean, you are in the retail space. Right. How have you seen it? Believe? So, as I, as I mentioned earlier, um, we are B to B to C sort of player. And we're, we're moving more into the B to C space. Um, but from the B to B side of it, we love partnering with um, what I'll call educators. Okay, and you know, some people call them signal providers, but they're more educators. Um, what we find there is that they, they provide a service of education. Um, they teach their, their, their customers you know, how to trade, when to trade, why to trade. Um, it's a really solid relationship because they serve as a buffer in terms of understanding to us, um, and they, they, they build a client base that's really well-schooled in, in trading options. Um, and it's, it's very valuable, especially from our angle. We don't want to have a lot of you know, blowout risk and people you know, blowing up their accounts very often, um, which doesn't happen with, a, with that sort of community. So we really push that, that combination of, of uh, educators and, and hand-holding, as it were, for the, for the retail customer. Um, so we're very involved in that, that community, which, which we find really helps. Got it. Mm -hmm. Lauren? Yeah, so taking off my exchange hat for a moment and putting on my direction hat as chief revenue officer, it was fascinating to learn that of the 80 leveraged and inverse products, which primarily gain their exposure from swaps and not options, but still a complex product, that we believe that 80 to 90 percent of the assets, of which Direction has 46 billion in assets right now, are retail, which was really surprising to me because <laughs> I would not have guessed that. And 18% of that is coming from overseas, particularly APAC, being more specific on that, Korea and Japan, who want to trade our products during US market hours. So education is really, really critical in partnering with firms that uh, allow us to inform and, um, and, and keep this retail trader abreast, there's just, it's such a critical aspect of it. Um, so just in talking about and bringing it back to the options side, in, it, Bloomberg recently released a stat that uh, actually it's 17% of all ETFs in the US are 
um, are are basically the um, sorry are, are basically based on derivatives in themselves, and that number has increased significantly since the the launch of not only the buffered ETFs but also the single single stock leveraged ETFs to a certain extent. Interesting. I would have thought it would have been a higher number because I think some of these innovations like fractional shares and ETFs are a form of derivative as well. And so it's sort yeah. of interesting um, how much of the underlying is not necessarily owned by people. Um, so yeah. let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, I think crypto is, is hitting lows again, uh, but it is part of the zeitgeist now, no matter what. Um, and if you could tell us from the seat you sit in and your own observations as experts, not just from your roles, uh, how you think the intersection of crypto and options will evolve and what has been surprising or unsurprising to you about it so far? So there's, there's clearly demand. I think every conversation I've had this week was about Bitcoin ETF options. And how do we as an industry bring that to meet the demand of customers in conjunction with, with regulators? So I, those conversations were all positive, and I see that's going to happen. We just have to have to be patient. For Memex specifically, we're a little bit one step removed. We're, we're not in the crypto business. At the same time, though, uh, we have three business lines, an equities exchange, option, options exchange, and what maybe a lot of people don't know about is we sell our market technology. And that market technology does support crypto trading. So we're sort of involved, but in the back, in the back seat. Um, I think from our angle, <clears throat> excuse me, um, we, we'd probably like to see a little bit more regulatory clarity on, on the product first. Um, having said that, we're, we're about to launch futures uh, in the next month or so, and there's, you know, there's products there that, that can mirror the the uh, crypto space, so that's that's definitely more palatable to us. Um, something like that, where the crypto is it's already regulated. It could be a future, it could be an ETF. Um, that's right up our alley. Something like that. I don't think we'll probably go down the, the path of walleting and and mining for for the actual crypto product, but any sort of uh, future or or ETF around it would be great. Got it. Yeah. So um, in the in the ETF space, it was. It was amazing early in January. There's never been a scenario where a brand new asset class was coming to market and there were 10 launches on the same day. I mean, that was, you know, thanks to the SEC. Um, that, that's frankly why it happened as they aligned all of the issuers to um, have that opportunity to launch. And, not continue to be disapproved as we were since you know 2013, 2014 when the first filing was made. So fast forward and you know congratulations first of all to the winners of those ten because there were winners and losers in that. But now what are we looking at? Now we're looking at Ethereum, Spot Ethereum, and there are almost ten filings in on the Spot Ethereum. The process of filing is under the 19 before regulation with the SEC where the SEC is placed on a clock. And that clock, which you're probably familiar with, is it, it, there's certain action items, that action steps that need to take place throughout the 240-day period. But in this situation, Van Eck happens to be in first with their 240-day clock ending on May 23rd, followed by iShare, um, I'm sorry, followed by, um, um, the ARC filing um, along with 21 shares on May 24th. They were not happy about being <laughs> second, <laughs> but it's, it's, it typically, typically is all about first to market. So we'll see if the SEC disapproves or allows for those products to launch, and it won't be the big bang if, in fact, that happens in May. Um, and then the next conversation is building out the ecosystem. Gerilyn, like you'd mentioned, so the OCC advocating and working hard on being able to issue the options on the Bitcoin ETFs, which would allow for, once again, um, you'd think I'm paid by the buffer share community, but it allows for, you know, 
serious you know, protection in very volatile markets if you want to stay in that investment of, uh, of Bitcoin. Thank you. Out of interest, how many of you have either a, a first, you know, a, a primary or a secondary uh, relationship to the crypto markets and the work that you do? More than the people who wanted innovation, so. I mean, we're going there. I see a few people who aren't <laughs> raising their hands because they're not paying attention. So there's more. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's fascinating because I think that ultimately, um, as a retail um, investor-facing firm, we find that the embracing of both options and crypto is one that is an unapologetic one among our users. And so I think that both the industry and the regulators are way pa behind where the appetite of the user is. And it's not just an appetite that is one of pure uh, naked speculation, but one that is also um, you know, informed and thinking through their strategy. Um, I think that speculation has been unleashed, so that's an unavoidable thing. But ultimately, um, it's fascinating when we do survey after survey, our users as well as retail investors at large, the most familiar products to them are stocks, which were founded like in 1789 or something. So, I mean, come on now. <laughs> and the second is crypto. Everything else is behind. Interesting. So it's a fascinating ecosystem that where the culture has caught on well before the industry has. Sounds like an opportunity for options to continue to grow. <laughs> exactly. Okay, yeah. so let's close it off with um, that clock. I don't know if, if it's right, so I'm going to, yeah. So let's close it off with the last question, which is about... Um, what, what either AI or supercomputing and the prospects of those kinds of technologies you think will impact, not just in the interim stage, but in the longer stage, the options industry? Whether it's, you know, the work that you do in your own firms, the industry at large, how do you think these technologies have already or will in the future impact options business? I actually use ChatGPT to create Memex's options fee schedule. No, sorry. Just, just, kidding. just kidding, just kidding. Um, but for those of us who are involved in options fees, I bet we all would appreciate being able to rely on AI to, to figure that out. Uh, so other, other than joking aside, there's nothing really significant to report from, from Memex. Um, we, we dabble it here and there, but it's all in the background, so can't really speak to it. Um, so I, I dabble with the AI a little bit, you know, at least relative to our retail client base. Um, Again, back to the trade idea generator, I think it has a usefulness there uh, to give people ideas on when to enter and exit trade, so you can, uh, it may be able to teach that. I think it's, it's obviously in its infancy relative to the trading part of our business. Um, however, I did, I did uh, chat with a potential partner recently, and their product is the ability to take a snapshot of a chart pattern and then place that into its AI model, and it spits out interesting data on whether the next moves are down or up and all that kind of stuff. I'm like, wow. Now, I don't know if it works. I haven't figured that out yet. Um, but it's interesting where, you, where the machine can actually give you indications of which way that stock or ETF can, can move. Um, so I think that sort of thing could, could really help a, a retail trader. Again, it's, it's the kind of thing I think that um, you have to have a pilot flying the plane a little bit who knows, knows how to work that and put in good inputs to get the great output from, from the machine part of it. Yeah. So um, that, that's what we're seeing a little bit already. So we're starting to see more of that AI stuff uh, hit, the, hit the front. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I agree. Chat GBT in the free version is not useful in the financial industry. What you'll want to do is either build out a system yourself within your firm or utilize one that's being built specifically for the financial industry. I've been spending a lot of time learning about this one called DAISY. It's with a Z instead of an S. And actually, I found it to be fascinating. Now, again, it's really been narrowly, more narrowly focused on the ETF space for advisors. But the, the, the system's really cool. It's, it's been launched recently, and with working with a number of customers, many, many upgrades are planned. But you feed in <clears throat> the right data, and you know that it's reliable data that we all rely on for our businesses and for our 
personal trading probably. But with that, you also feed in, say, your Morgan Stanley research or whatever research you, you need to, to bring. And what it can create, the system can create, is highly reliable, dependable investment research that an advisor can customize specifically to their client. And it will create actionable recommendations, and I use recommendations lightly on this, actionable measures, actionable recommendations that this end client can receive based on the data in easy to read infographics in the palm of their hand in real time. It's pretty cool how granular you can get with this. I mean, one example that was shared with me is, say, grandma and grandpa love gardening. So you can build this content with analogies to gardening and place it in a podcast using Morgan Friedman's voice that they can listen to while they're gardening. So. And it's the, the, the best part of it, and the most important part of it is what I know you're thinking, is the requirements from FINRA, from a regulatory standpoint, can also be and have also been built into the system. So there's more confidence from, say, Foresight to go ahead and um, approve this piece much quicker than they had because it's coming from this source. Now, I know it sounds kind of like dreamy, but that's where we're headed, you know? And in addition, I mean, you can write a piece that's real cool, that has that Gen Z Swifty approach, you know, if they're, you know, you could, you could go anywhere with this. And, um, and so I was pretty excited about this as a, as a potential opportunity in the space, given, given the fact that you know, that, that FINRA approval takes so long at direction. I mean, it was taking two weeks, three weeks turnaround time. By that point, you miss the trade, especially in the space that direction offers products in. So this does expedite it. So I'm kind of excited about it. More so, to come. And it's just scratching that. the surface. No, I, I love the excitement. So I'll leave you with this food for thought. Um, so our firm... About 55% of our customer base is millennial, and another 17-ish are younger than them. So it is, you know, I often talk about it as like tomo serving tomorrow's investor today. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we find when we survey around um, any kind of AI use and investing, not just gardening, you know, stories for your grandmother, but like actual investing uh, there are three, and we ask people to rank where they find information and how they trust information. And their ranking is consistently, I first trust community, which is why we built out a social investing platform. Whether that community is in my internet, sort of in the interweb community or my physical community. I then trust technology. 40% already use any kind of AI system to do research for their investing. 60% say one day they would trust it more than an individual. And the third thing they trust is institutions. Number three. Mm -hmm. So I would just leave you with this thought, which is that I think that every industry is going to be thoroughly disrupted by this technology. And I think that is an exciting thing, because I think disruption and creates innovation. Um, and it's very interesting, whether it's ChatGPT, Pi, or Grammarly, how ver verse, in, versed people are, this generation is, in this space, and how they expect innovations from us um, from it. So it's an exciting time to be alive in options. So yes. thank you so much for yeah. your uh, joining us, and thank you for the panelists. Thank you. And have a wonderful conference. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast.
For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. <laughs>